So I'm Tom Frank, uh, journalist, uh, and I'm here to introduce Bill Black. PhD in history. I do have a PhD, that's right, but well, I wasn't going to mention that. You'll see why in a second. And uh, Bill, I think, is the most famous former bank regulator in America. I often joke with him about that, thanks to his uh, deeds back in the savings and loan days, back in the 19, what, the early 90s. And he's also a professor of law and economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City branch. And you're at the University of Minnesota now, but I'm not quite clear on what your, uh, what your title is there, so. Distinguished Scholar in Residence <laughs> for Financial Regulation. Oh. Anyhow, so uh, how long do you want me to talk, by the way? About a minute and a half, or less. <laughs> okay, all right. So uh, Bill's signature idea, uh, for which I think he'll be remembered for a long time, is the concept of control fraud. and it's been very, you know, spelled out for us today what control fraud is, what he means by the idea. And it's basically what happens when the officers who control a firm use their power over the firm to enrich themselves while driving, <coughs> while driving the firm itself to the boneyard. And, uh, you know, they loot the company using uh, uh, fraudulent revenue and executive bonuses. Am I getting that right, Bill? And control fraud is something, as, as we've seen today, that happens again and again and again in the real world. And there's, you know, countless examples, SNLs in the 90s being very prominent, uh, Enron, the housing bubble. And yet control fraud has still proven to be a very difficult concept for our country's leaders to understand. In fact, uh, one of the main prosecutors of mortgage fraud said that it made no sense to him that banks might defraud themselves, therefore there was no need to look into criminal behavior at banks. Now why is it that we resist this idea of control fraud? I mean, there's tons of evidence that it's actually happening, that it happens all the time. I think one of the reasons that we resist it is because if Bill is right about it, it would require us as a nation to radically change our uh, political course. If Bill is right, and he is, then the economic consensus that has prevailed in this country since the 1980s is basically wrong, and Democrats as well as Republicans are implicated. Financialization and bank deregulations are, uh, you know, these are consensus ideas shared by the leaders of both parties, uh, has been a colossal mistake. But the idea of control fraud is also disturbing in a larger sense than this, in a sense that Bill has been emphasizing to me over the years and that I've been trying to work into my own, uh, or to reflect in my own writing, and it's this. The control fraud represents the corruption of the professional class, as a class. I mean, just look at the examples we've heard about today. Real estate appraisers, accountants, federal bank regulators, consultants, lobbyists, well, lawyers, right? And everybody else, right up to the, uh, the CEO, has been suborned and twisted by the insane incentives that are on the table these days, you know, that are peeking out at you everywhere you walk in this town from the other side of the revolving door. <clears throat> now, uh, consider our president for a moment, Barack Obama. Like so many other members of his party, he's been a pious worshiper at the shrine of genius. He has Nobel Prize laureates advising him, Nobel laureates, Pulitzer Prize winners. Hell, the former president of Harvard advising him. I mean, and just, just look at the roster of Ivy and Oxford certified scholars who sit in his cabinet today, and they have to be the best because they're the smartest. But when Bill tells us that people, that Tim Geithner and the sort of, uh, Tim Geithner and people like him are in fact promoted because they failed, which is one of your most famous quotes, I believe, he's contradicting this, the, the, the Obama doctrine in the most um, fundamental way. He's telling us that our modern system of checks and balances is a fake, that our whole proud facade of meritocracy and Ivy certified brains is not what it appears to be. That instead of an age of accountability, we live in an age of massive corruption. Um, and this goes against, I think, everything that we liberals like to believe about ourselves and our own brilliance. And I think it's an idea that our historians will be uh, working with for generations to come. And here he is. Right. Thank all of you for coming. Um, the we were very much um, touched by the uh, support on incredibly short notice of Campaign for America. This is a group that has uh, worked for Americans for a long time. I've had uh, you know some uh, association and the opportunity to do some things uh, in conjunction with the group, but. Uh, 
and there will be a future rollout of a campaign for America that we won't spoil at the, at this time. But please come uh, back for that uh, as well. Uh, the second thing is I'd like to bring together what the, the stories you've just heard, right? So first, uh, fish rot from the head and uh, organizations rot from the head as well. You don't get pervasive fraud in an organization unless the people at the very top, at um, the absolute minimum, are willing to turn a blind eye. And it typically has to go far more than a blind eye. It takes an active role, in particular when people blow the whistle. Right? Second, this is a subgroup of whistleblowers. Whistleblowers come in all kinds of different strands. None of these folks our, uh, none of us as these founders are remotely disaffected employees, right, who were in trouble uh, and uh, therefore we, were, we knew we were going to get fired and we decided to gin up a story uh, of how we had become uh, whistleblowers or something. This is a group uh, with track records cumulatively, we're really old, of uh, <laughs> 130 plus years of uh, experience at really high levels, whole steady progression of uh, promotions until, uh, and getting it right, right? And the things that we're in trouble for are getting it right. And that's why I said about Geithner, it's the Geithners of the world who are willing to get it wrong when the people in power want it to get wrong. Uh, that are promoted these days to the ultimate uh, positions. And to pick up what my colleagues have said, we didn't reach out to be whistleblowers. That wasn't, nobody ever had that goal. I assure you, almost nobody in life has that goal of being a whistleblower. You know that retaliation is certain in these circumstances and that your life is going to be made miserable. So. Basically, you know, when you go into the airport these days, you see the sign, right? If you see something, say something. Well, we saw something, we said something, then life got really interesting, right? Um, in where interesting is an interesting word, uh, for it got really, really bad. And so we have both uh, Richard Bowen uh, and Michael Winston from the inside in the current crisis at really senior levels. That's very unusual for whistleblowers. Uh, again, track records of success where they simply tried to do the right thing and then they suddenly discovered they were in Alice in Wonderland where nothing made sense anymore. And for folks who've grown up in banking, as Michael said, he didn't grow up in banking the way uh, Richard and I uh, grew up in banking. This is, was a startling change. Right? Because banks were old, fuddy-duddy, careful, lots of internal controls, literally a dozen plus levels at uh, Citigroup and others of that size. So all of those have to be stripped away because underwriting is the great tell in the poker sense. Right? To be able to do these scams, you have to gut your underwriting. And that makes no sense for an honest bank. And by the way, that's how we prosecuted them successfully back when we used to prosecute. That's why we got over a thousand felony convictions just in cases designated as major. That's why we hyper-prioritize the cases. The top 100, 300 institutions, 600 individuals, the best criminal defense lawyers in the world, they're representing the CEO, they get to use the organization's money to defend themselves. So they spend like money like water, and we had a 90% conviction rate. And to do that, we made over 30,000 criminal referrals. Well, in that entire crisis long ago, we did not have a single whistleblower who came remotely close to the level of my co-founders of this organization not remotely close. No one we could use as a major witness. In the current crisis, at every one of the largest institutions, it has been not just a whistleblower, but a whistleblower of incredible qualities, of competence, of getting it right, 
and as Michael uh, talked about, ultimately the integrity to say no to these things. And now to put on the hats that Gary and I have, this is extraordinarily valuable if you're going to bring an enforcement case or if you're going to prosecute. The difficulty, of course, in these cases is, in jargon, mens rea, the guilty mind. Well, that is precisely get what gets demonstrated by the cover-up. And the cover-up is when someone blows the whistle and says, 80% of the loans are fraudulent. So let me cut through what Richard Bowen was saying. When he says 80% is defective, what does that mean? It means when you looked in the files, it didn't have the information on income, the borrower's income. But you must know the borrower's income to know whether you're making a safe loan. And the requirement was that it be there. <clears throat> so it was selectively removed by the people selling the loans to Citigroup. Why do you selectively remove information? Because it's adverse. And it wasn't unimportant information. It was the most critical information to a lender. What's the income of the borrower? What's the real appraisal value of the home? Right? All of these things, in other words, that got up to a fraud rate of 80% at one of the three largest financial institutions in America. Now think of that. If Amazon cheated you 80% of the time, would you continue to buy things from Amazon? Right? Jurors understand this. Administrative law judges regular federal district judges, state judges, understand this. This is how you actually make a case. So when Richard and when Michael blew the whistle, they made it possible for people like Gary, and if I were still employable in the federal government, which I'm clearly not, people like Bill Black, they gave us cases on a platinum platter. And we have zero, as Robert Borisage said in the introduction, we have zero prosecutions of the people that actually led the three great fraud epidemics. So the third thing, what do we propose doing about it? I will do this very briefly because we have detailed proposals. And I will say as an overview, we carefully crafted them to require no new legislation and no new rulemaking. The no new rulemaking is important in the modern era because the courts of appeal are so virulent in striking down rules that they don't like personally, right? So there are no excuses. You can't say, but, well, I'd like to do things, but I don't control the Congress. Or I can't do it because the Court of Appeals or the D.C. Circuit struck down my rule. This is a real gut check, in other words and we ask Americans to go to your candidates, whoever your candidates are, as a group, we are nonpartisan, and say, will you support these proposals? If not, fine, you're on record that you don't uh, agree with those things. But if you are, then you will have a proposal to actually restore the rule of law. So that's the first thing we propose, restoring the rule of law. Now, that's going to require leadership changes. And by the way, while I've talked about candidates, the current president of the United States of America could do this. He could begin doing this tomorrow, right? So we made this plan uh, also for President uh, Obama, if he's willing to do that. And we asked people to uh, join us in urging that he do so. The restoring the rule of law, yes, it requires new leadership, but it also requires restoration of a lot of mechanical things that have been eliminated, like the criminal referral process. In the savings and loan debacle, we made over 30,000 criminal referrals. In the current uh, crisis, um, the same agency, the Office of Thrift Supervision, made zero. And it was the regulator of Countrywide, Washington Mutual, IndyMac, elements of Lehman Brothers, elements of AIG. In other words, it should have been making tens of thousands of criminal referrals. So we have a whole, about 18 specific steps, 
all but one of which can be done with no new legislation or regulation. The only exception is we call for a um, dramatic increase in the size of the FBI white collar section. And that would require budgetary authority. But everything else can be done. And again, we did it with just as few FBI uh, agents. The second uh, major uh, task is to bring back the most powerful provisions of Glass-Steagall. And again, we would do this through authority that has existed for 25 years, the individual minimum capital requirement. By definition, these systemically dangerous institutions, which people can't even get themselves to call by the right name, they use the euphemism systemically important, like as in your, their gold star. But the definition is when, not if, when the next one fails, it will cause a global systemic crisis like this. Right? That's insane. We are rolling, we have roughly 25 of them. The rest of the world has roughly 25 of them. So we are rolling the dice just in the United States about 25 times a day to see when the next one is going to blow up and take down the global economy. That's crazy. So if you set a capital requirement that actually reflected the risk that that institution the, the, any institution that poses a global risk is so large that it would have a capital requirement that they would sell, they would divest, and they would shrink. Similarly, our third uh, substantive one uh, has to do with bringing back the best provisions of Glass-Steagall. And we would do the same thing, use the existing authority under individual minimum capital requirements and say, Look at the failure rate of the entities that did large amounts of investment banking. So we had five big investment banks, three of them died. That's a 60% failure rate. The other two had to be bailed out, so it's really closer to 100% failure rate. But on top of that, people forget that as soon as we gutted the rules, which was done mostly by Alan Greenspan, People began to do investment banking activities, and the first and biggest was this place called Bankers Trust. And if people don't remember Bankers Trust, it's because it instantly got into a series of scandals involving its uh, sales of derivatives, and those scandals and the losses that resulted were so large that it had to sell. And it was one of the ten largest uh, bank holding companies in the United States of America. You also may not, unless you're from the Northeast, recall Fleet Boston, which was the seventh largest bank holding company and went heavily into securities and promptly got into scandal as well. Both of these places defrauded their clients, were sued, suffered massive losses, massive loss of reputation, couldn't raise capital, and had to be sold. So you add those in, and then you add Citigroup in. Now we've been discussing a different part of Citigroup that was alone enough to sink it. That's the thing Richard Bowen has talked about. Uh, but this too, the investment banking activities of Citigroup, according to the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, put them on death's door. Right? So these are all enormous entities, all of them systemically dangerous, all of whom failed doing these kinds of activities. Again, any risk-based system, and that's how it's supposed to be set, your capital under this individual minimum capital requirement would be so large that you would have to sell. So that's our third major initiative. And our fourth is, again, comes out of the savings and loan debacle. In the savings and loan debacle, when we, the federal agency, brought the enforcement action or the Department of Justice brought the indictment, we actually spelled out in English language what had happened, the fraud mechanisms, right? If you look at a modern statement of facts by the Department of Justice in coordination with any of these settlements, they are designed to be unreadable by normal human beings. And they are designed explicitly to be useless in civil litigation for plaintiffs who've been victimized. It's utterly outrageous. And they, by never having a contested case, 
They never make public the fraud mechanisms and the rot in the system. They simply cannot expose those. Well, all those things used to be exposed in our pleadings, where we would, in detail, in plain English, explain the fraud mechanisms. And then they would be picked up with no fear of libel or slander by media, because they would be reporting what the federal government had just charged. At that juncture, invariably, the politicians who took political contributions from those institutions rushed to return the contributions or to donate them to charity. That never happens now. As Robert and others have said, look at the number of institutions that if you can parse the deliberately opaque statements of fact, have clearly admitted that they committed massive fraud. And I mean hundreds of thousands of fraudulent transactions totaling in the hundreds, well, the, the tens of billions of dollars, right? These are the largest and most destructive financial frauds in history. To my knowledge, not a single politician has returned the money or donated it to charity. I think we think you should change that. And we asked uh, candidates to pledge that they're going to no longer take money from the financial felons that have been identified in these statements of facts where they've admitted to these frauds. So uh, that's what our, in a nutshell, our proposals are. Again, we end with thank you very much, and uh, I thank my colleagues for all of their sacrifices. So uh, we can do qu questions now. Art, are you yeah, still okay on time? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so if there are questions now, we'll take them as a group of the founders. Really, my only question is, what could have and what could all of these people have done differently to go even higher to find somebody to stand up to a Rubin or a Mozilla or Mary Jo White or Congress uh, senators? And since it's all going on today, Bill came right back to this. All the things you're proposing require leadership change. If we want leadership change, who do we find <coughs> will stand up to these people? Well, I think there's two parts of that. <laughs> Internally, Obviously, I was still trying to find someone with the moxie, if you will, that would that would fix it. That was my job. I, I felt like I had to do that. That was that was what I was supposed to do to protect the shareholders, and ultimately going to Robert Rubin. In hindsight, obviously, I should have gone outside soon. Um, not that it ultimately did anything, because when I went outside, nothing happened. Um, and so that, that, I'm sorry, that no. raises a question. How far, in, in any setting, how far outside do you have to go? Uh, is that Gary, something you guys are here. talking about behind the scenes? May I jump in here yes. for just a moment? Yes, Gary. The answer to that question is the key. How far do we have to go? What about the, pre what about the president, Obama? Where, who is the principal donator uh, to his <coughs> funds uh, when he had his uh, inauguration ceremony, Wall Street. Where do we have to go? We have to go to the public. The public has to demand a change. The difference between now in 1929 and 1933 and 34, when the public demanded a change was four years of excruciating pain suffered by the public, and then they demanded Congress make a change. And that change was made by, a, by Ferdinand Pecora, who had tremendous public support. I think the public has to make a decision, and I think that's why we're trying to tee this up for the candidates, so the public can speak to them there's nobody higher. I went from my assistant director to my uh, associate director to my director to the head of enforcement, and I was crafting an email to the chairman of the SEC when they fired me, and that's why they told me to go on vacation. And then I was going to go from the SEC up another notch. But it was pointless because it is ingrained in the fiber, in the DNA of our Congress, of our government, to defer to Wall Street. And until we change that DNA, it's going to stay the same. 
And the only way the DNA is going to be changed is by pain, and that's the public's pain, or by an awareness that that we're trying to spot. So uh, to tag on to uh, what Gary said, PCORA was actually the third effort at investigation. The first two failed. And PCORA was not an expert in finance. He was a judge. And before that, he had been a litigator. And so, uh, unlike the modern era, whenever we create a commission, we put politicians on it. And the politicians are selected to be hyper-partisan, right, uh, in most cases. And they do the questioning as opposed to the professionals. So you can always stall the question. It's like in Congress, right? They get three minutes, and you just give an answer that takes seven minutes, and um, it, it works really well. You couldn't do that with Pecora. He was doing the questioning. He would stay as long as he needed, and he would hammer you and the facts would come out, and the facts help change things. So that's what we're trying to do. First, we want a modern PCORA commission, right? Uh, and second, it is people from the inside, like Richard, like Michael, like Gary, that, again, PCORA really didn't have the advantage of this kind of level of whistleblowers. He had of some, but now we have literally hundreds of whistleblowers able to tell this story if people have the political will to make it happen. Let me, let me follow on that for one second if I can. I have requested, when I experienced what I experienced in being forced to change my testimony at the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, um, I, and these are not just my allegations, this was thoroughly fact-checked by the New York Times before they exposed it in an op-ed uh, in September of 2013. I have gone to two congressional committees trying to get them to perform a congressional investigation, the Senate Banking Committee and the House Financial Services Committee. I have contacted the chairman and the ranking members of each one of those committees trying to get this accomplished with this demonstrated violation of law from my standpoint as to what occurred at the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. And we have not been able to get anything done. Uh, and again, it doesn't look as if they wish to actually lift up the lid on this. So there is an attempt to, to go to that. There is an opportunity for a PCORA-like hearing to basically wake up the American public. Um, if it's going to be given an opportunity to happen, I, I don't know. 